Hey, what's up? I'm Jason, and today we're going to talk about game development, or what it's like to work on a real AAA game at a AAA studio. I want to do a whole series on this where I'll talk about all of the different positions that I've had on different games and different projects, so you can get an idea of what it's like on the inside, and you know, just I guess a real honest inside view of what the day-to-day -day is like, uh, what you're doing in these jobs, what it's like working at these companies, and a lot about how much fun it is too. So I'm going to start with the QA department because that was my first entrance into game development or professional game development it was joining a QA team to do some QA tools. That of course morphed and merged and changed into something completely different, but that's where I started so that's kind of where I want to start. Now I'll probably start with how I got the job because that was really different and unexpected and probably not what you, I guess not what you would expect at all it was a very unconventional way to start a new job and start a new career before I do though I just wanted to ask to please um, share the video if you don't mind just go share it on Facebook or Instagram or MySpace or whatever things are around today that you want to share on or um, just hit the like button and if you have questions about this stuff or you have your own experiences drop a comment below I'd be kind of curious to know um, what kind of questions people have about working in the game industry that I haven't thought of. So if you got them, just drop them below. And again, just remember to share or hit like or something. Anyway, let's get started with how I got the job. So my first game dev job was on this game right here, Vanguard, which is nicely hidden right behind my lamp so that you can't see it. But it's a Vanguard Saga of Heroes. It's an MMORPG made by a lot of the guys who made EverQuest. If you're not familiar with either of those, they're kind of... Uh, predecessors to or EverQuest was a predecessor to WoW I'd say it's um a MMORPG game you, you get in you build characters you level up you kill things and you group in all, all the standard stuff Vanguard was another version of that so uh the guy who started it Brad McQuaid um missed the dude but um anyway so he left Sony Online Entertainment to start another company Sigil Games and build up this Vanguard game and um I don't know why I'm mentioning all the stuff about the game. I'm talking about how I got the job, right? So anyway, I'd been playing EverQuest for a very long time. I'd been playing it since it came out in, I think it was the late 90s, and this was you know, around 2005 or 2006. So it had been a long time that I'd been playing the game, but I hadn't logged in in like a year. Then one day I log into the game. I load up EverQuest to patch it up, and I'm like, hey, I'm just going to go in and say hi to some of my old EverQuest buddies and just see what everybody's been up to, right? time I was working at Intel doing some software development it was really testing test tools for their server systems it was a very small little tiny piece of Intel stuff um, anyway I'm logging into this game to just go say hi to my friends one day randomly and within the first minute or so I get a message from a guy I hadn't talked to in well over a year who was also the old GM from my EverQuest server. And um, on EverQuest, the GMs or game masters were essentially people who would do both support. So if something would go wrong, they'd get little pop-ups and they'd go around and help everybody. So if something breaks, an NPC gets stuck or you get you know stuck under the world or some weird thing, they would be the ones to come help you. They'd also run events and do special things on the server though. So if you had like a, a cool holiday going on or some just special event that they wanted to do, they'd summon NPCs and go through the whole role-playing thing. And they were also really um, helpful with new encounters and new content. So at the time when I played EverQuest, I ran a hardcore raiding guild. So we would go kill all of the top stuff and try to get world firsts for killing things. So they would kind of follow us around and see what kinds of things were going wrong and what issues were, you know, popping up that we were discovering a lot of the time uh guilds on other servers were a bit ahead of us so they would find them first but sometimes we'd stumble into something new and you know discover little interesting bugs anyway sends me a message this, this guy that i hadn't talked to in a while who was the gm of my old server and says hey um i think his words were you know how to code right would you be interested in coming to work on vanguard with me and it's like of course. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'd been wanting to work on video games for a long time. I just never kind of found a way into it, partially because of the area that I was living in. And um, I'd say just a lack of drive. I didn't really push hard enough for it. I probably could have gotten into game development a lot earlier if I'd just actually gone out there and put myself out there and tried. I just didn't think I could. So I never really got into it. I never tried to 
to do it, right? So this message was life-changing for me because he goes, hey, would you like to come work on this game with me? Um, I need somebody to build some tools for our QA department. He was running the QA department and just wanted somebody to come in and make some tools to make their job easier, maybe be able to automate some things away or simplify it, make so they could do things faster and just test more stuff or test better. So I was like, of course, I'm definitely interested. Um, I talked to my wife about it, who was very hesitant, but eventually came on board. And I'd say, oh, eventually, but she was pretty quick to come on board, which was awesome. Thanks again for that, by the way, if you're watching. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I, I go through a quick interview process after this. I talked, it was a quick phone interview with some programmers who I believe were the ones doing the tool development at the company at the time, because they also knew C Sharp and this job was going to be to develop a lot of C-sharp related tools for the QA department, right? So I went through the interview. They asked me some very, very simple stuff. It was a really relaxed phone interview asking, like, the only question that I still remember was, what was the difference between the public and private keyword in C-sharp? Just to give you an idea of how complex it was. It wasn't anything too hard to get into. I'd say this interview was probably the easiest one I've ever had. So anyway, I eventually take the job and I got two weeks to move down there. I did not bring my wife and kids with me at the time. I had a, my wife and two little ones, toddlers at the time. And I just moved down by myself and ended up moving in with another guy on the QA team, David, who was awesome. Thanks for that, by the way, David, if you happen to watch this too. So I moved in with him and uh, started the job. So I come down from Washington to California, go to this apartment, and we're just driving back and forth to work every day talking about game development, which was a cool part. But when we're actually in the office, well, the first day is always interesting, right? You get kind of walked around. They show you all of the different areas. This is the code department. This is the art department. This is design. This is design. This is design. And then a bunch more art, right? Lots of artists and lots of designers on the team. I think the total team size was over 100 people and like 20 of them are programmers. So everybody else, almost everybody else was either art or design. Um, and then there's the QA department. QA had one little room. It's smaller than my current office that I'm in right now. Had three sections or three stations set up, three computers, one of those being mine, the others for the other two people that were in the QA department. And one was only there kind of part-time on QA and the other time he was doing a uh, web development stuff. So we had one full-time tester and then me doing test tools and testing and another guy doing web stuff and testing. So they're all in this little tiny room. And the building, to be honest, was, I think, just slight, starting to get outgrown. So it was nice that we at least had a room and we weren't in a big open area that was super loud, I guess. So we get in there. Um, I get set up and that always takes you know, a day or two to get new computers, get accounts, get everything. In fact, the worst case I've seen is like taking a week to do all this stuff. At Sony and Sigil, though, it wasn't nearly as bad. So it was like a day or two. I get all set up and day one or whatever it is, day two or three, I'm actually starting to test. And we're going through these manual test plans. So when you're doing QA, a lot of the time, what you're doing is you get a new build. So the coding team or the uh, design team or art team or probably a combination of all of them will put stuff in. They'll keep committing things. And then a new build goes out in, in the morning. A lot of the time, I think we had builds multiple times a day, but a lot of time there was just a build in the morning. They would go to the dev server. And then our job was to get on there and run through this giant, um, I think back then it was an Excel sheet. It may have been, I don't think Google Docs were it were common back then. So I think it was an Excel sheet. We'd go through this Excel sheet um, step by step and verify all of these things. Like I can create a character. I can level up. I can kill a thing and gain experience. I can summon items. I can you know, cast abilities. And you're casting all these different types of abilities. You're not doing everything in the game, obviously. But you're testing a little piece of each part of stuff that's in the game. Um, and a lot of the time, these, these lists get there they grow over time right so you've got this list of stuff that you're checking for every build and when something goes wrong that you didn't catch like you a build goes out and suddenly like you can't ride your horse or whatever it is then adding that will usually happen so or what i'm trying to say is that part or that thing that failed will go into the next test or to get added onto that sheet so then there's one more step and these are usually like a couple hundred steps of stuff to make sure that the server is good the client is good and our build is at least okay it doesn't tell you that there are no bugs it doesn't tell you that everything is good with the new stuff it just tells you that the server at least starts up and kind of works 
So anyway, I'm running these tests every day. And while I'm doing that, we're also talking a little bit about what kind of tools would be helpful for our team to have. Like what kinds of things would be useful for our QA team to know about? Um, what, what can we do to make this easier? One of the first things was being able to know what things actually changed in the data. So we wanted to be able to know like what abilities actually changed when they did an update. So the designers would go through and maybe like change a hundred abilities and we want to know like, hey, did they actually change first off? Like, or did they just like resave it and it changed the update time? Um, did they change anything other than like the description or the text? Like did they change the way the ability works? Did they change numbers on it? Like what were the changes that they made to it? And we wanted to be able to see that and we really didn't have a way to do it. So this was kind of my first task, right? Like figure out a way to make it so this is knowable by our QA team. So we can say, hey, what did they change? How did it change? And what do we need to test? So that way we're not testing 300 abilities every time they update. We're just testing the ones that have actually changed. We're testing a couple of the regular ones and then all of the ones that have changed. And we can get a much better coverage and not miss things that changed and broke because designers accidentally did something wrong with their data or something didn't say right, right? So start building this tool up in, a, I think it was ASP.net in C Sharp, just trying to put together a little comparison tool to show what it was like before and what it's like now or what things changed basically. And to do this, I needed access to multiple databases to be able to read like the state of this data now and the state of it in the old database. So we had multiple databases so we could see the diff and see what had changed or see like what was in one versus what was in another and actually be able to compare them. So. This was actually really exciting for me because at the time I didn't really know crap about databases. I knew very lightly how to use a SQL server and how to hook that up to something like a ASP.NET where I could write data to a table and read data from a table. That was about it. That was kind of the limits or the extents of what I knew. Like I knew how to kind of write a select a little bit and throw that into some C sharp objects. And I think I was using data tables at the time and, um, yeah, I knew how to show that on a web page. That was like you said, kind of all, all I really knew. So this was a really good opportunity for me. I got to build a tool that would start reading in data on all of these abilities and just populating it in from two different databases and then trying to compare them. Of course, the code that I wrote was total garbage, right? Like it worked eventually, but it was total garbage. But the bigger part or the most exciting part for me was learning a lot about how the game worked and how the database worked and how people set up these bigger relational databases when they have a lot of content. And this Vanguard game had 30 something thousand abilities in it. So there's a lot of content. There's a lot of stuff going on in there. And the database design was well, pretty well thought out, to be honest. The DBA was really good at his job and came up with a good design that was, I'd say, worth learning about, right? So yeah, being able to learn from that was really helpful. And it kind of, I'd say, led me down a path of doing a whole bunch more data-related work in games later on. So when I went to transition from doing QA stuff to doing tools programming, knowing this database stuff made a giant difference. It made it very, very easy to know what to do and um, how to do it really. And to come up with really interesting, fun ideas that I think kind of made it even easier. Um, I'll talk about that all later though when I get into working as a tools programmer in video games. So on, on top of building this tool though, I'm still constantly testing things, right? So a new build comes in and we just go in and try to break things. Also, one of the more interesting things that came up in this was finding exploits and dupes in the game. So if you're not familiar with them and MMOs, a lot of the time people will find ways to cheat. They'll find ways to either kill things they're not supposed to kill, kill things too easily, or they'll find ways to make a bunch of items or make unlimited money. There are a lot of different types of cheats and exploits. And when it's a multiplayer game like this, they are a huge, huge deal. We have to find them and we have to fix them. So a lot of the time what would happen is people would report, hey, um, somebody's doing something bad. I think that they're they're cheating, they're exploiting. Like I keep seeing this guy going back and forth across these zones or I keep seeing this guy dying to the same thing over and over and over. And somebody would report them and then people would go try to figure out what they did. Um, when I was working in QA, we would get these reports all the time. So designers or other people on the team would go, hey, 
this thing is happening. We don't know how to reproduce it. We don't know exactly what they're doing. We just have a light idea of what's going on. And our job would be to go in and figure it out. So we'd try to go, okay, well, let's see if we can reproduce it and see what kind of cheats or exploits we can figure out from this. So one of the fun ones I got to do, again, was trying to reproduce a dupe issue. So it was a problem where, I can't remember the exact details, but you would go across the zone line and die. If you timed it right, you would end up with, I think, a corpse on one side of the zone. So you end up with a corpse on the starting zone that you were in. So like you're in this little city area, you go right across the zone line where it loads, kind of like zoning into an instance if you're not familiar with the zone line. But you're going into it, you'd leave a corpse on the original zone, and then you'd pop over to the other zone with your full body. Then you just go back over to the other zone and loot that corpse. It all came down to an issue with the what was a persistence server at the time. There was a whole separate server to deal with persisting that was meant, at, like the whole goal was to prevent these types of exploits and dupes. The final result, I think, was that the persistent server just got ripped out because it didn't do what it was supposed to do, and they're trying to hot fix it and figure out how to get it working and get, get the exploit gone. I think the server just got ripped out of the entire pipeline and things got simplified a little bit, and the exploit went away. Of course, there were probably plenty more. In fact, I think I remember finding a couple more, but this was just one of them. And we got to do that quite a bit, just look for different ways to cheat. It was like a almost like a free pass to go in there and try to cheat, right? You know, I mean, it really was because you well, it's a paid pass to get in there and try to find ways to cheat, which I, I enjoyed a lot, just trying to figure out ways to break the game, ways to find um, new ways to cheat and get new items or defeat things that I shouldn't be able to defeat. Um, but this job didn't last. So my QA job in all of its glory lasted, I believe it was a total of three weeks. After that, I got laid off. So I got in there and I was working, 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 having a blast, building up a couple different tools, which is kind of surprising thinking about the timelines. I was very quick and sloppy and dirty with the stuff, but it, it worked out. Right? Anyway, so I'm building up all these tools and three weeks in, find out, oh, the company is actually um, doing some different stuff and it's getting sold back to Sony. And because of that, there are some layoffs planned. And before I'd even been hired, all this was in, in process. And they'd already had a list of people who were getting transitioned over to the Sony team. So I had been kind of slated for layoffs before I'd even been hired. Um, luckily, while we were going through this process and they're explaining to everybody, hey, um, you know, layoffs are happening. You'll find out what's up. You know, what, what normally happens with these layoffs is they go, oh, yeah. Um, we're gonna, we're having some changes. We're getting bought. Um, some people may get laid off. We're going to tell you about it on Monday. I think that was the scenario. There was, it was a Friday and they're like, we'll give you all the details Monday when you guys come in. Um, just go take the day off and enjoy and relax. And, you know, everybody freaks out and waits until Monday. Uh, when that happened though, one of the guys on the team was, I was Andy came and told me, Hey, um, you know, he told me the scenario that everybody that was getting kept on had already been decided, but they really liked the tools that I had been building for their team, for the QA team. And because the designers had been also using these tools, they wanted to, um, keep me on board. So, but they couldn't do it right then. So they were just going to rehire me in a couple weeks. So they said, Hey, um, We'd like to just you know send you an offer in a couple of weeks once this thing's settled and we're in the new company and just get you back on the team. And I was like, oh, this is freaking awesome. By the way, let me just talk about that. The designers using the tools. So when I was building these tools for our QA team, I was also running them by our designers that were that were there, our game designers, so that they could see what the tools looked like, um, how they worked, and tell me if I was crazy. Tell me if the data that I was seeing was valid or not. Um, because I want to make sure, like, hey, are these actually the things you changed? Am I seeing the stuff that you changed? Or am I just seeing random stuff because my query is wrong and I don't know what the hell I'm doing again? Totally new. So the designers seeing the stuff that I had built and then starting to use it themselves because these were all just web apps, so anybody at the company could really access it, made a huge difference. If it hadn't been for that, I probably would have been laid off, moved back, and done something completely different. I certainly wouldn't be reading this or 
I wouldn't, say we, I wouldn't be talking about this right now, and I probably wouldn't be doing a bunch of game development right now. It could have totally changed it and totally soured me on game development, right? I may have gone back and just been a, uh, a web developer or something, uh, something much less exciting. <laughs> and I say that having done web development and plenty of other dev stuff. So it, showing your stuff off and getting it out there is extremely important even if you're in QA and showing it off across the company to other people and just kind of making friends with other people helps a lot too so anyway offered me uh they offered me the new job a couple weeks later it actually ended I think it took about six weeks before I got the new jobs and moved back and then eventually moved back down and I'll talk about that in the next video where I'll talk about what it was like being a tools developer um some of the crazy stuff that happened like my first day as a tools developer, which was really weird. I got this huge project and I felt like a total fake and had no clue what the hell to do and kind of I had a little freak out and was like, oh, this is going to be either a lot of fun or a giant disaster. Um, anyway, I'll talk more about that one later. So if you're interested in just hearing more about game development stuff, um, kind of what it's like, what kind of things we do day to day in the jobs, what it's like working in these companies, um, just let me know, drop a comment below. Again, my QA stint was very, very short, so I don't have a whole lot to say. I mean, I still blab for 20 something minutes about it, but I don't have a lot to say about it. When it comes to programming, it's been a ton, right? I've done lots and lots of code, lots of programming in tools, um, game server stuff, all, all the fun stuff on a couple different games that I'd like to talk about. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, just make sure that you hit the like button at least, or like I said earlier, go share and all that. And um, also special thanks to everybody on Patreon. Really appreciate it. And uh, I think that's about it. All right. Bye, everybody.